Uh, for a few weeks now, we've been looking at uh, a series which I've kind of titled Spiritual Things in Church. And you might think, well, that's kind of silly. It's all kinds of spiritual things in church. Well, there is, and sometimes they're not all the right spirits. Uh, sometimes the human spirit gets involved, yes? May I, before you start? Okay. saying of this sense of something about to break loose, two identical concepts. The way that we will be able to handle the influx is through those gifts of the Spirit. So I want you to pay particular attention to <laughs> what the pastor's been teaching the last few weeks, it will be what helps us minister to those that are coming in during that time. That's what they were intended for, for us as a group to bless each other and to be a blessing to those that would come in. So pay particular, the Lord's already said it twice, so let's pay close attention to what he has to say. Amen. 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 Thank you. So I'm not going to talk about spiritual gifts. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> Funny thing, though, I am, but I'm actually going to, in the middle of that, take a side trip, and I'll tell you what, what, where I'm coming from. We've been looking at this, the idea of the, the spirituals that happen. Romans, or 1 Corinthians 12 talks about, uh, Paul starts out saying, about spiritual things. I don't want you to be ignorant. And actually, spiritual gifts in a lot of our Bibles, but actually it's spirituals. So when we think about spirituals, what is that? That's a broad range. It's not just gifts. It's the way of the Spirit. And one of the messages in this series was just that, the way of the Spirit. We started off looking at 1 Corinthians 13 and say that it's all about love. That the way that we work together in the body of Christ is all about love. And we follow the way of the Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit. And we, we've looked at this from a couple different ways. And we said last week that we're all different. It's the same spirit. Mm -hmm. But he gives gifts differently to different yeah. people. Yeah. Look to the person next to you and say, you're different. Yeah. There you go. We're all different, right? And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It'd be a really boring world if we were all the same. And not only our looks and our likes and our preferences and all of these things, uh, our hair color, you name it. It's, it's more about that. It, it's not just that. It's about what God chooses to use us in. What God chooses to gift us in. And listen, this is the normative practice of the church. This is the way the church started. There, is, there was not a point in time where the church all of a sudden said, hey, I think we're Pentecostal. No. no. It, it was the way of, it, the church was born in Pentecost. Yes. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about a, a name that we use today or denomination or anything like that. But the church is Pentecostal because without the Holy Spirit, we can't do anything. Yeah. Right. We can do church without the Holy Spirit. We can build a building. We can have services. We can do prayers, you know, the kind that you script out or whatever. We can sing songs. We can do all these things without the Holy Spirit. But if the church is really going to be the church, we cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. Right. This is the way we're designed to be. Why is it that it seems like, as you look back through history, that people have just gone to great lengths to try to do it on their own? People today are still trying to do it on their own. It doesn't work. But I'll tell you what, God will bless the church that understands that its role is to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And He doesn't leave us on our own. He's, he's allowed us to, to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. If we're willing, He will fill us with His Holy Spirit. And if we cooperate with Him, He will use us in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not for our own recognition, but for the blessing of others and for the glory of God. This is Church Growth 101. With all the seminars that are out there about how to get people to come and stay and do all that stuff, some of that has its place. But by and large, Church Growth 101 is seek God, 
expect his gifts. This is the way we're designed to be. Every single person in this room, if you're born again, God wants to use you in the miraculous. Yes. And there may be some that sit and listen to a message like this or a sermon series like this and say, oh, that's for somebody else. I don't know about that stuff, and I'm just going to be, I'm just going to sit over here and relax. Well, you can do that, and you can be born again, and you can get to heaven. But, my goodness, it's a whole lot more about hanging out till heaven. If it, if it was just that, why wouldn't we, you know, he'd take us as soon as we're, we're saved. Yeah. Uh, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the church, and we need one another. So, you have a, a, a scripture, I'm going to direct you to another passage of Scripture, but for now, let's just look at what's on the screen. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 from the New Living Translation says, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. The body of Christ is His church, not just the first assembly of God, but His church. All born-again believers throughout the whole world comprise His church. And we are all parts. None of us is the whole body. None of us is all that. You, I know you meet some people that think they are, but they're not. And there are other people that think they're not a part of the body, that, oh, I'm not equipped enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not whatever enough. And that's not true. That's a lie of the enemy to keep you back Amen. from what God wants for you. We are all part of the body. And then I want us to look at another verse from 1 Corinthians 12, 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Amen. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Amen. We're a team. Amen. We're a team. Lone Ranger Christianity is not biblical. I'm glad that we stream. I'm glad that we have social media. I'm glad for all of those things that we're able to get the message out. And I'm glad that there are people who are, are stuck in their home, going through an affliction or for whatever reason, and they can't come to be part of this. And I'm glad we have the opportunity to minister to them. But that should not be the standard. Yeah. That's right. Stay home and watch the show is not church. Right. It's not. Coming here and watching the show is not the church. It's what we bring to the table together, what we do together. I got to tell you, last Sunday night we met here, first Sunday night, we had about 40 people, and, and again, the, the service just took a life of its own. We've been doing this, come into the room. Let's just come into the room and see what he wants to do. There's no long message. We didn't even sing a song. But every time we end up praying for one another and encouraging one another, and some people had word for one another, words of wisdom, and a word of knowledge, and we saw a lot of the gifts in operation. And man, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. 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 Give you a commercial. If you've never been part of one of those first Sunday nights, it's easy to remember when it is. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you, you may get to 5.30 at night or in the afternoon on a Sunday, and you may be thinking, oh, I'm so tired. I don't get much of a break. I work all week. I'm just going to relax. You can do that, and there's no condemnation. But can I encourage you to push through that and come meet with us here? That'll be September, whatever the day is. We'll start that again. Uh, at any rate, we need one another. There's also a verse in Matthew 7.20. Jesus was talking about false teachers. And he said about, you, you've got to watch, because they're like ravenous wolves, and they will seek to devour, and they'll seek to get in among you, you meaning the church. And he sums up his message to his listeners. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you can identify people by their actions. Amen. By their fruits, you will know them. Yeah. So, while we are not to judge the intents of the heart, we certainly are able to judge or identify fruits. Mm -hmm. 
talk a lot about the gifts of the Spirit, and it seems like a lot of times when gifts of the Spirit are emphasized, sometimes the fruit of the Spirit is not. And in other camps where they're really afraid to talk about these manifestation gifts or, or they don't believe they exist anymore, they will, they will by default say, oh yes, but the fruit of the Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. They're both right. There is not a contradiction yes. between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. There are two different issues that add together to form the way we are designed to live. Amen. The way that God has recreated us to live. So I want to take a little exit from 1 Corinthians 12 today. Understanding, setting that foundation again, reiterating that we all have the potential to operate in, in uh, giftings far above our pay grade. Far above our uh, history, far above our skills and talents, and far above our pedigree. <laughs> but also we are called at the same time to exhibit godly fruit. And while the gifts of the Spirit is plural, fruit of the Spirit is not. Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to ask you to turn there with me this morning. Again, Paul is writing, <clears throat> and he's writing about the fruit of the, of the Spirit. He also talks about the fruit of the flesh, and we're actually going to read some of that because sometimes uh, we don't get the whole thing. But we're going to look at Galatians 5, verse 16, uh, the whole way over to 26. Galatians 5, 16, the whole way over to 26. You know, I've mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again. When Paul wrote the letter to the church in Corinth, he was writing a letter in response to a letter that they had written to him. And they were asking questions. This was uh, a group of believers uh, who were young believers. They were young in Christ. Uh, they, a lot of them came from a pagan background where there were sacrifices to pagan idols. Uh, Aphrodite and, and all of the other uh, gods and goddesses of the uh, Greco-Roman world, which are no gods at all, but yet in their idolatry they were actually glorifying Satan. So as it is, as it happens sometimes, when you come out of a lifestyle that is anything but godly, sometimes some of the habits take a while to fall off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some of the, the things that come out of our mouths, uh, some of the things that we do. Uh, maybe our temper or any of these things. Sometimes it takes a while for some of these things to fall off. And some people who have been following Jesus for a long time, every so often that old flesh kicks in and we can find ourselves saying and doing and thinking things that surprise us, that maybe they were part of the way we used to be. So it, it's a, when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, when we look at the, the qualities that should exist in the life of a believer, it doesn't mean that there aren't times that we fall off the horse. <laughs> However, I, I just don't like to talk about the times we fall off the horse because it's almost like in our flesh we're giving ourselves an out. Well, I had a rough day. Good. Uh, so did Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, oh, after this day, uh, yeah, Paul had a couple of those days too. So, Yes, we are going to fall short, but, but can we not focus on that? Yes. Because you've heard me say it here before. Usually the people who say, well, nobody's perfect, set out to prove it. Right. And that should not be our attitude. We, we should understand that just as God can use us in the miraculous gifts, He can also produce in us miraculous fruit that is far beyond, right? If the gifts of the Spirit are not anything we own, well, then the fruit of the Spirit is nothing we own either. Huh? This is a work of the Holy Spirit. This speaks to a sanctified life. When we're born again and we decide to turn from the way we've been living and follow Jesus, He forgives us, He changes us, He makes us into a new creation. We should expect that 
at the moment we're born again, that there is a change. We're, we're set apart. If you're not set apart, you just said some prayer or fill out a membership application or did something like that. But uh, the born again experience is a work of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We can't be good. We can't just decide to adhere to a certain list of requirements. We will fail miserably. And then you feel even worse. And that's why a lot of people don't get it. They show up in church and they think, if I just keep going to church, if I just keep singing the song, but they never come to the end of themselves and say, take, take everything. I'm sold out to Jesus. There is a sanctification. There is a, a change in our lives where we are less like the world and more like Jesus. But it's ongoing. Huh? You can attest to that, right? Maybe there was something that you struggled with uh, earlier in your walk with Jesus, and now you look back and say, well, that's no longer a problem. It's no longer a temptation. God has taken that from me. I used to be addicted to being on the road in ministry. I can't imagine ever staying in one place more than one day. He took that from me. That's a little different. But he will also reshape your desires and your priorities to fit uh, what he wants for you. So we're going to look at this, this whole passage. And in my uh, Bible, the, the title, the pericope says, Living by the Spirit's Power. Paul is writing to the, the uh, believers in the churches of Galatia who were falling back. A lot of the Jewish believers in Jesus were kind of falling back. They wanted to get back into their old-time religion. They, they were uncomfortable uh, living by grace. And they felt they had to do something to prove themselves worthy of the grace of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, you're foolish. There is nothing. There's no way you can prove yourself worthy of the grace of Jesus Christ. If you could prove yourself worthy, then Jesus need not come. He need not have died. He need not have gone through all of that in his life. And he's saying, listen, don't. Don't go back to trying to live by the law once you've experienced grace. So, uh, with that, he is saying, listen, when you live by the law, you're under condemnation of the law. But when you live by the Spirit, something happens. You live differently, even without the written law. When you live by the Spirit and you are in touch with God through the Holy Spirit, you don't need a list of what to do and what not to do. The Holy Spirit directs your path. This is Christian life. Some people go to church their entire lives and don't get this. And I've been to thousands of churches talk to tens of thousands of believers, and so many times I hear stuff like, well, I haven't missed a Sunday in 37 years. Well, that's awesome. But what's that have to do with your righteousness? I've been a good Pentecostal for, what does that even mean? Why are you touting this as something that somehow, oh, I've done this, so therefore, no, it's all filthy rags without Christ. That's what our righteousness is. With Christ, we wear His righteousness. We're no longer filthy rags. But listen, when you are living by the Spirit, there is fruit that will come from your life. So Paul contrasts it this way. Uh, verse 16, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But, there's always a but, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. So, keep in mind, the struggle he's talking about is the struggle of someone who is trying to gain favor before God by their works. Not that the flesh doesn't creep up and, and remind us maybe of, of what we used to do, and, and that old flesh maybe starts to say, yeah, you need to go back and do that again. Not that there isn't a reminder of your past, 
But the child of God should not have to constantly have this battle. Because if your life is all about the battle, then that tells me that you have not totally submitted to the leading of the Holy Spirit. See, Paul is, remember who he's writing to. If you're battling trying to keep the law of Moses, if you're battling the outward acts that fulfill that list of do's and don'ts, you're always going to have a struggle. Because on one hand, they're trying to live by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, but on the other hand, they feel bound here. So there's always going to be a struggle. And the law, as Paul also wrote, the law points out sin. The, the main purpose of the law was to say, here is what living for God doesn't look like, right? But the law was given before Jesus. We needed the law not to be righteous, but to show how far we had missed the mark. So with Jesus, we understand that, wow, so he has made a way, God has made a way through Jesus that I can have all of that paid for, and now the Holy Spirit lives inside of me to teach me what to do. I don't have to look outside to follow laws and rules. So he's saying here to these Galatians, listen, if you're, if you're trying to do both, this is a struggle. You're going to have this struggle. As long as you listen to the Spirit of God, you're going to do what's right. When you listen to your flesh, you're going to do what's wrong. But then there's that but. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. So I, I oftentimes like to extend grace to the laws of man when it comes to speed limits. And, and I can do that. And I can do that. And I can still go to heaven, but I may get a speeding ticket. We're not talking about man's laws here. We're talking about God's laws. And, and how we react to what we are to do and not to do. So the example is this. Let's say you have some habit that you're trying to give up. You're trying to break. Under the law, if you're looking at it from a law point of view, you believe that God hates you and condemns you as long as you hold this habit. And that's a self-condemning attitude, and you'll find it very difficult to emerge from that habit. However, if you take the attitude that there's nothing you can do or not do to make God love you any more or any less, that He has paid for this sin, and He loves you so much that He wants to deliver you of this bondage, see, you're going to be living by the Spirit. If you live under condemnation, you're just going to keep sinking down and doing the same things over and over again. If you live by the Spirit of God, there's a freedom and a love from God that says, I love you so much that I want to help you get free. Yeah. So these Galatians were really tied up, right? And he said, no, listen, listen, if you live by the Spirit of God, there are some things that, that you are just naturally going to walk into. Well, then he gives some more comparisons here. Uh, verse 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. And then he makes a list. Certainly not exhaustive. We could probably add some to this. And your translations are going to render this differently. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. That's a pretty long list. Of Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. If this is your trajectory, and this is your motivation, and this is how you live your life, and you're seeking for ways beyond Jesus, whatever that way may be, You're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. What's that mean? It means you cannot live that type of lifestyle and claim to be born again. Amen. You can't do it. Does that mean that whenever you have a burst of anger or, or a jealousy creeps in that you've lost your salvation? No, not at all. But when this is your priority, 
You cannot claim to follow Jesus and do that. It, it's just the way it is. And it's, it's not legalism from the outside in because the church has been really good at that. And while there are some things we can lament about that we wish, we wish they still did this in the church. We wish more people would. And some of those we can go, yeah, that's a shame. Other things I'm glad we don't do anymore. Not wearing a tie and a suit jacket when I'm preaching. That would have been one thing, probably get me brought up before the board. <clears throat> women wearing slacks, uh, men with hair over their ears, women with too short a hair, too much jewelry, not enough jewelry, uh, don't yell loud enough, yell too loud. I mean, the list just went on and on and on. And you, I, no wonder some people don't go to church, right? right? And thank God we've gotten over some of this stuff. But that doesn't mean we throw out everything. We, we don't just add Jesus on to what we've got going on. We live in a very pluralistic society. And a very, people talk about spiritual things. Well, I'm, I, are you a Christian? Well, I'm spiritual. Well, everybody's spiritual. But which spirits are you listening to? You, you can't just do a smorgasbord here. If Jesus is the only way, he's the only way. And you have the right to believe that he's not the only way, but you don't have the right to tell me that I can't preach that Jesus is the only way because the Bible says he is. Amen. So I don't mean to be against, I'm not trying to be against people, but I'm saying you, you don't just get to call yourself a follower of Jesus because you showed up in a church with pews and a steeple or you said some sinner's prayer. Right. It has to be a life lived for him. And, and Paul is writing to Galatians and we can take it today slightly different context they're talking about going back into a works-based uh jewish system but we can get caught up in works-based system too right. especially when we say well at least i don't do what he does mm -hmm. well at least i did this right and and this is the same thing when we put our faith in anything except jesus when we trust any spirit but the holy spirit we just can't see the kingdom of heaven. It's that simple. So then Paul goes on to, to cheer you up a little bit. In verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And I love that last verse, there is no law against these things. If we take that out of the context and where it belongs, it doesn't really make sense. We think of maybe a law, like I said, speed limits, you know. And that's not what it's talking about. The, the word that's translated law here is most often translated as from the law of God, speaking of the law of Moses. And I, I've, I've <laughs> I paraphrase this, part of me says, and there's no one that says, I can't do this. There's no law against it. But even deeper and in context with the rest of us is there is not a law that you can keep that will produce this. There's no outward law that keeping it will produce this fruit. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it's singular, it's not fruits. We can't say, God, will you please make me faithful? But I, I really don't like the self-control thing. Uh, Lord, can you make me gentle? But I really, I really don't want to be peaceful. It's, it's the fruit. And there again, just as we say the nine manifestation gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 are not exhaustive, this list is not exhaustive either. Here's the bottom line. The Holy Spirit is going to make you look like Jesus. The Holy Spirit is going to make you act like Jesus, to live like Jesus. When, when we look at the temptations that people without Christ face, they should not tempt us. They, they, should, they should almost make us sad that people are trapped in some of these kind of things. But there is no law, there is no list of what you do or don't do that is going to create genuine fruit in you because it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 24 continues, those 
who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. And I might say they continue to do it. They continue to do it. I don't know if you've ever had this conversation with yourself. Well, I'll work on this first. And then I'll work on this. And sometimes we do that when we have goals. We set short-term goals and long-term goals. But I think oftentimes we, we think, well, I'm going to work on being more gentle. I'm going to work on being more faithful. That means telling the truth, right? And, and doing what you say you're going to do to, to God and to others. I may work on this. When really what we have to understand is it's a work of the Holy Spirit that produces all of this stuff. Don't limit God by making a list of all the things you got to stop doing. <laughs> Don't limit God by making a list of all the things you want to start doing. Yeah. Just give your life to Him. Amen. Let Him do it. He produces the fruit. Yes. Probably a number of those things that I mentioned. Uh, let me put it this way. With all the different people here, and we've already established we're all different, you look at some of those, and there may be one that stands out at you as something that you really would love to see come out of you more than it is now. And I think that's pretty common. And I think that's why the Holy Spirit spoke to Paul it, to write these things as representative of so many of the things that our flesh holds on to. Listen, our spirit is free. Someday our flesh will be. Our mind is being renewed day by day. Yes. Someday it will be perfected. But while we're walking in this earth, the flesh that we walk into every so often is going to raise its ugly head, and we're going to have to daily crucify the flesh. We're going to have to continue to bring those things before God and nail them to the cross. Verse 25, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Not just our Sunday morning part. Not just our prayer meeting part. Every part. Not just the parts that other people can see. All the parts. This is, this is a sanctified life. This is, this is a life that says, I'm all in. I'm holding nothing back. Too many people don't know why their life keeps going downhill. And, and I'm talking believers, but they've not given everything. It's not so that you have a bad day or that God cramps your style. It's that he has so much more, so much more, and he cannot wait to give you. He, he just loves to whisper the secrets of heaven into your ear. But too many times we're bound by so many of these things in the flesh, and we just don't quite ever get to where we've submitted everything. Since we are living by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let's not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another, which is a great way to circle back to the concept and the topic of spiritual gifts and that they are together. It is about love. It follows the way of the Spirit. It celebrates the uniqueness that each of us have, and we do it together.